But let's move into some climate change news. Uh, this is a pretty cool and shocking uh, visual from Jeff Berardelli. Uh This is what's happening with the jet stream in the next couple days. So let's just watch this on a loop for a second. Wild. Wild. Can you say polar vortex? So this is from today until Tuesday, or Wednesday, sorry. <clears throat> Did you see that Phoenix high at 59? Phoenix is going to go from 110 to 59 in September. We're supposed to go from 114 to 73. That's pretty big swing there. Denver going all from 98 all the way down to... What is that? 29 degrees. Good Lord. Casper, uh, is that Wyoming? Down to 30, from 92 to 30. That's, that's crazy. Um, yes, so that is, uh, that's what's happening with the polar vortex on climate change. And you know, everybody here should know why that's happening. If you don't know, and you're new here, that's happening because warm air, the jet stream is weak because of Arctic amplification, much hotter temperatures in the Arctic, and the Arctic, the warmer Arctic air is pushing out that cold air, and the jet stream is so weak, it's not going to keep the cold air where it's supposed to stay, which is the Arctic. So that is... Arctic air leaking out. Uh, Arctic air leaking out of the Arctic in, we'll call it early September, and causing a polar vortex. You know, something that generally happens in the wintertime, but now not so much. Now it's going to happen in, in what is still summertime in the United States. We're going to have a major polar, polar, polar vortex event event right after a major heat wave event uh this is classic a uh, classic example of weather weirding weather wilding weather whiplash as you know paul beckwith might tell you uh paul beckwith also has a, another good video out i think it was today or yesterday about what's happening in the arctic um Kiro Hikes Phoenix is 104 degrees today. Poppy Davis, fun with climate, indeed. Clay Bomb, what's that going to do to the crops? What is that going to do to the crops? I would say 30 degrees, under 30 degrees is going to it's going to take out a lot of crops, right? So isn't this uh we're we're going into harvest season. Good point, Clay Bomb. We are going into harvest season, and we're going to get basically a freeze in some places that may, that are, are most likely have crops in the ground. Yeah. Oh, you know, it's something I missed here in the, um, on the political side, but, you know, I think it has to do very much with um, climate change. This is from Jennifer Zeng. A, a video from China, a state-owned food store in Beijing. Will China go back to a planned economy? Or is this preparation for looming food shortage? I talked about this issue in this show. Um, so apparently they have state-owned food stores popping back up in China for various reasons, possibly for a coming food shortage. Due to what? Let's just call it, call it what it is. Due to what? To climate change. Um, because the food shortage is because of the major massive floods they're having in China. And still, typhoons heading towards South Korea in, in, the, in the vicinity of Japan, also in the vicinity of China. Um, let's move on to an update 
about Roger Hallam. Um, I believe his partner is tweeting for him. Number five, or Roger mostly denied vegan or vegetarian food. Seven days, no pillow, outside cell once for 40 minutes in five days, no access to library, but is writing. Our lives begin to end the day we, be, we become silent about things that matter. That is a quote from Martin Luther King. Go out on the streets, act as if the truth is real. An update also from Beyond Politics. Um, Dr. Diana Warner and Roger Hallam still held on remand at Eastwood Park and Pentonville presence, prisons, respectively. Uh, I believe there's a way that you can send Roger Hallam a card or a message. Um, that is not hard to find if you are w wanting and willing to send Roger Hallam a card or a message while he's in jail. Absolutely a political prisoner. For organizing strikes around what? Around <laughs> climate change and the eventual extinction of humans on, on Earth. Um... You know, the, the, the people in power, the people in charge, the government at large does not want you to know about this or think about this or understand this. I miss this in the political section too, guys, but I'm just going <laughs> to just, it's funny. Uh, I don't think anybody lost their lives in this, but multiple boats sink during Trump boat parade on Lake Travis. So, you know, the boaters for Trump seems to be a thing that Trump, you know, likes to, t you know, these beautiful boats, all the beautiful boats, boaters for Trump. <laughs> they went out on a big, there was a big rally, Trump boat parade on Lake Travis in Texas and a bunch of boats sank. Bow, bow, bow. Uh, just good for a, just good for a laugh. All those beautiful boats <laughs> sinking in the waters of Lake Travis. Uh, poor guys, poor guys. I, it, apparently, what was what was funny in the one uh, video of. One of the boats singing, nobody was wearing a life vest. So somebody was like, they don't care about masks, life vests, you know. Whatever, take, take, take no precaution at your own risk. Judy Truitt, you have to have some money to afford one of those boats. Yes, you do. And then that boat goes down, 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 down to Bikini Bottom. Let's look at some updates on sea ice from Zach Labe on Twitter. August 2020 was another month that the Arctic is yelling for you to pay attention. <clears throat> this is where we are, just above 5 million square miles or kilometers, excuse me, of sea ice. Um, this is a temperature anomaly. The temperature anomaly, August 2020. Arctic temperature, May through August 2020. Here. Here. Way up there. Where was the last high? <laughs> we'll, we'll call this 2016. Look where we are here compared to the last two highs. We'll call this 2012, 2016, 2020. Laptive sea ice. We saw this the other day all the way down to rock bottom. As a nun, nine, yet. Very frightening.
Kiro Hikes, being, being vegan in jail means you're going to eat a shitload of chili-flavored top ramen, though. No joke. Yes. Uh, yes, yes, indeed. Um, let's move on. I'm going to close some of these guys out. Hold on one second, guys. I saw this, so I saw this tweet from Climate Watcher, and immediately, well, first, it says, first 100-plus seat aircraft to cross Atlantic, powered by 100% renewable energy, will win Freedom Flight Prize. I was like, is this happening now? You know, I, I was kind of like, whoa, you know, crazy. Um, that was, you know, that was awful quick. They're going to have a transatlantic you know, uh, renewable energy, whatever, you know, renewable energy. What does that mean? Exactly. Like where does this energy actually come from is batteries powered by what, you know, we're going to, we're going to assume it means like some kind of battery power, solar wind, whatever mix nuclear. No, I don't know. Not nuclear powered airplanes, but you know, why not? They actually did build a nuclear powered airplane at one time. But I, you know, so I thought like, oh, this is the way that this is worded m means like it's happening now. Plane must complete return trip London to New York. Each leg of the trip under 10 hours and finish return leg 24 hours starting. So when I actually looked at the article, um, what this is, is a contest to build the first renewable energy airplane that's going to cross the Atlantic. And, and I'm going to go down and show you the timeline. So here it launches right now. So this is the challenge actually happens now. There's a bunch of funding and the actual flight happens 10 years later, nine years later. Um, if it happens nine years later, maybe it will, maybe it won't. I don't know. We'll see. Of course, they're going to build a lot of planes between 2020 and 2029. There's going to be a lot of regular planes being built and flown for those nine years. So maybe we should stop those planes from flying first. You know what I'm saying? Does that sound logical to you? Um, you know, while we're busy, you know, making contests and challenges and you know what I'm saying? Because that's, that's, that's 10 years from now is a long way off before we get the first plane ride across the Atlantic. And we don't even know that that's necessarily going to happen in nine years. Um, and then they're going to have to, you know, and then they're going to try and build a whole lot of planes, you know, which of course is, they're not all going to be built with renewable energy. I can tell you that much. Uh, Clay bomb says, we'll, we will be back in the stone age in nine years. Just, just, uh, oh, I wanted to insert <laughs> just, to, just an aside. If anybody's been watching, um, Guy McPherson's videos, he's been putting out some, uh, he has a couple series headlines and ask an ecologist, but I was watching one of them and he was, he said, does anybody have any questions for Sam Carana? <laughs> does anybody have any doubt who Sam Carana is? He said, the only question you can't ask about Sam Carana is who is Sam Carana? I mean, I, I think I think at this point he's pretty much admitted that he is Sam Carana. So Sam Carana is Guy McPherson. Guy McPherson is Sam Carana. Uh, I, I think that's pretty obvious, since you know Guy McPherson has a direct pipeline to Sam Carana. <laughs> he's taking questions for Sam Carana in lieu of. But anyways, Sam Carana is the one who, who writes all the articles, not all the articles, but many articles on um, Arctic News blog. <laughs> so anyways, I just thought that was funny. I, I mean, I, you know, I think he, I don't think that he's really trying to hide 
it, I mean, it just sounded so obvious when he said that. I was like, are you trying to hide that? Are you really trying to hide that you're Sam Coran? Not really. Anyways, <clears throat> um, here's, a, here's a, a tweet in response. Go Green tweets, California experiencing hot house earth temperatures that can kill. This is a hashtag climate emergency now in 2020, ignored by big oil Trump and GOP. Also, you might want to add Sir Go Green or Ms. Go Green or whoever you are. You might want to add that the Democrats don't care either. They just, they tell you that they care, but they actually really, they really like the fossil fuels and the big oils and they support all that stuff too. Don't forget that, please. Um, Yes, big oil Trump, of course. Trump is a is a is a major major problem for the climate. Absolutely. And the Democrats are just a little less of a problem for the climate, but still a huge problem for the climate, right? Um anyways, Jessica responds exactly so. Why are scientists still talking about 2030 or 2050? Who's going to be alive then? Uh, two excellent questions, Jessica. Grateful Dan says Sam Carana is being interviewed by Guy McPherson next month. Really? Well, I, you know, okay. If Sam, if Guy McPherson, well, so is this going to be a live interview or is Sam Carana going to be like, you know, is he going to be like more, more, Morse coding Sam Carana. <laughs> like, while wow. is what does a live interview mean? Does he mean like he's gonna text Sam Carana questions while he's on doing a live stream? I mean, co- that's cool. If Sam Carana is a real person, and Guy McPherson's gonna interview Sam Carana, that would be cool. But I just, it was just kind of funny to me the way he worded that. <laughs> I'm taking questions for Sam Carana. You cannot ask who Sam Carana is. Anyways, who knows? Who knows? Um, yeah, cure, well, sure. In a, in a, I mean, he makes no secret about using, you know, basically collating you know, the, the work of others or studies of others to say like, he, you know, he's, he has peer reviewed papers, but he's like, look, look at all this evidence, look at all the evidence. And that's basically what he's doing. And I find no, pro- you know, I, why not? I mean, that's, there's nothing wrong with that at all. That actually the preponderance of evidence surely backs up, you know, what he is, what his theories are, or what he's claiming or what he's predicting. And I, you know, if he is Sam Carana or if Sam Carana is Guy McPherson, and so, so what? I don't know. There's no problem with that. <clears throat> Kuro Hikes, I think Guy McPherson is a good dude. I don't care what anyone says. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm not saying that Guy McPherson is a bad person. I'm just thinking, I'm just saying that I, I, I find that uh, there's been a long standing kind of, you know, there's been a long standing. Uh, Suspicion by a lot of people that Sam Carana is Guy McPherson. So maybe he isn't Sam Carana. I don't know, but I just th- th- felt that was pretty funny. Um, no, I mean, I th- I don't think anybody would be here if they didn't understand. And and going south, I'm Sam Carana. <laughs> I don't think anybody would be here unless they had come across the work of Guy McPherson, and unless they believed that the work of Guy McPherson had merit. And and I, you know. I wouldn't be here if I did not think that the work of Guy McPherson uh, didn't have merit. It has absolute merit. And I will go on to say, I will add, many, many climate scientists or climate communicators or people who are aware of the climate keep going towards Guy McPherson and not away. There are many more people who are like, oh, yeah, maybe he's got maybe he's got something there, right? Like more people are agreeing with Guy McPherson as climate change progresses then don't agree with Guy McPherson. And I would say that the people that don't agree with Guy, Guy McPherson might have dubious reasons for not agree, agreeing with him or for 
or for slamming him or discrediting him, et cetera, et cetera. But who knows? When when Guy McPherson uh, interviews Sam Carana, I will be I will be there. I will be there to watch it with with uh, bated breath. Valhalla five six Sam Carana is a pseudonym. Guy already outed himself. Oh, did he? Okay. Well, I mean, maybe I'm late. <laughs> maybe I'm late. Uh, anyways, but I thought that was funny. I thought it was a funny, uh, funny exchange on a show. <clears throat> uh, anyways, let's move on. Um, we have a lot to cover still. Another tweet from Go Green. Greedy humans killing the forests that give us oxygen and keep us alive. We lost a football pitch of primary rainforest every sec- six seconds in 2019. Um, sorry, I meant, so yeah, there you go. That's a headline. We lost a football pitch of primary rainforest every six seconds, six seconds in 2019. If you can imagine the scale of that, let's move on to another headline by David Wallace Wells or a, He tweeted this uh, article out. Scientists have calculated how many mammals might be lost this century, suggesting at least 550 species will go extinct. Humans are almost entirely responsible for recent extinctions, they say, and rates will escalate if we don't take action. When? When do we want it? What do we want? When do we want it? Maybe I'll come back and read this article uh, tomorrow, because uh, I want to get on to the article that I wanted to read. Um, this from Climate Watcher. To prevent blackouts, California needs more clean energy and bigger, better run grids. I kind of, I had a problem with this. Um, he's just tweeting out another article, basically saying saying that, that very thing. Um... I said, what about localized solar energy or clean energy and and less grids or no grids? What about that? Um, More on the heat wave in California and the West is from Jeff Birardelli. The best word to describe the weather across the West is bonkers. The region will experience some of the hottest weather ever recorded in California. A strong downslope wind event igniting fire concerns. A 70-degree swing in temperatures and a foot of snow. Weather whiplash. Um, maybe we'll come back to, to that article tomorrow. I want to get to this article um, before I run out of the time. Human love solidarity. Leave guy alone. Nobody's, nobody's attacking guy. Nobody's doing that. I was just pointing out it was funny his his funny exchange about Sam Carana. Um uh, I hope nobody's attacking guy. Um that wasn't the point of what I was saying. Uh anyways. Russ Taylor, you don't need a bigger grid, you need more gas lights. Chi Chi Conley says, since he wants us to wear masks, I don't like Guy McPherson anymore. COVID measures are out of proportion. Well, um, I you know I, I hate to break your uh, bu- burst your bubble, Chi Chi. I mean, I I wear a mask when I go out in public, and I wear a mask when when you know when required, and I suggest people do it when they're required. I I, I actually also too agree with you. Um, that in some places, not necessarily here in California, but in some places, some, some cities and states, the COVID measures are out of proportion. Um, but it is an actual disease that people are dying from and getting sick from. So I feel like, you know, you should honor the reality that it's it's an actual disease that people are getting and getting sick from. So, you know, 
don't get other people sick and don't get yourself sick. Um, but I'm open to, I'm open to also all kinds of ideas about why this is happening or where this came from or what, you know, what the government is doing as a response. And I, you know, I understand all of that, but I think suggesting that you wear a mask is not, uh, not only, you know, logical in some places, but you know, it's advisable. If you don't want to wear a mask, do so at your own risk. And you're, you know, um, do so at your own risk, right? You know, like if that's how you feel, um, but you know, there are, I, I, I don't really want to see people get sick and die, and I don't really want to see this continue to go on and on and on and on and on. However, we may or may not. <laughs> we may or may not be in control of that on some levels. But just on a very basic, very basic face value level, people are getting sick and people are dying from this. And I don't want to see people get sick and I don't want to see people die. And if wearing a mask helps people not get sick and helps people not die or transmit the disease, I suggest that, you know, take those precautions. Um, that's all. That's all. And if you don't like me, I, you know, I don't know what to say. Oceanic estate at this point, it's irrelevant. And then there's that too. I mean, I think a lot of people, and I wouldn't even call them, you know, I, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of friends of mine. I have friends all over the place who are like, this whole thing is a scam. This whole thing is a, is a panic parade. Um, and they are not Trumpers on any level, on any level. They are not, you know, libertarians or Trumpers or any of the, like, they're not any of those kind of people. They're, they're lefties. And they're like, this thing is a scam. This thing is a, is bullshit. I'm like, if that's how you feel, I'm open to the idea. I'm open to all the, you know, I'm open to all the ideas. I'm just saying, you know, as a basic precaution, <laughs> I'm 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 wearing a mask and I I like it when other people wear a mask and maybe don't fight people in supermarkets over it. <clears throat> so there <clears throat> there we go. <clears throat> but you know, in your own life, do what you do, you know, go for what you know. Um Scott Andrews, COVID is getting bad here in the Midwest. This is what I hear. This is what I hear. Grateful Dan, the masks are polluting our oceans even more. And, and then there's that. There's the sloppiness of mask wearing. But <clears throat> there's a lot of issues. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of issues. Um, people dropping their masks, you know, by their cars or their gloves or just, you know, blah. You know, the, the random mask polluters. <laughs> The masked polluters. Um, <clears throat> uh, Judy Truitt, but they are unscientific in their thinking, though. Well, I, you know, I, I, I honestly cannot make that claim. <clears throat> I mean, you may think that, but I. Um, I believe science. I also believe that some, you know, some scientists are, are, I actually believe that some scientists are working, working for the man, right? And they are giving you pseudoscience because they're paid to. That also happens. So those two things happen simultaneously. Pseudoscience by people who are bought and sold, that, that does happen. And then actual science by people who are doing actual science, that happens too. <clears throat> so, you know, believe science and also believe that some some scientists might want to bullshit you those two things can ha those two things can exist simultaneously um anyways but unscientific i mean by unscientific i mean they don't understand biology <clears throat> no i mean these are i honestly these are people that totally understand biology and they totally understand they just they they just have a different take on it and um <clears throat> excuse me i'm not going to um i'm not going to shame people for having you know alternative ideas about what's going on because i you know 
I have I have met multiple ideas about what's going on in my mind all at the same time. So I'm I'm you know, I would like people to to be careful and not get other people sick. Bottom line. I would like people to not get other people sick. Bottom line. That's all. Um Anyways, let's let's move on. I, I want to read this the last article I want to read before we go. <clears throat> Uh, and before my computer gets super hot, I don't know. Sorry. I don't know how much ice I got left in this baby. It's like the, literally, this is a science experiment for the Arctic ice cap going on right underneath my computer. <laughs> and, uh, scary, scary times. Anyways, uh, this is an article by, Ma uh, Maddie, Maddie Hune. The privileged have entered their escape pods. Technology gave us the dream of a cocooned future. Now we're living it. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, this piece is a spiritual successor to the survival of the richest, a report about how the wealthy plot to leave us behind after an apocalyptic event. Many of us don't like who we have become in this pandemic, but feel little freedom to choose otherwise. Officially, we may be wearing our masks to protect others, but it sure does feel appropriate to hide our faces when we're engaging in so many self-interested survivalist activities in the light of day. Leveraging whatever privilege we might enjoy to stock and equip our homes so they can serve as makeshift bunkers, workplaces, private schools, and hermetically sealed entertainment centers. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Dang it. <clears throat> sure, because I'm still being paid as a professor at CUNY, I donated my government relief check to the local food pantry and am sending a significant portion of my income to friends who can no longer meet their basic expenses. But I also went and spent $500 on a big rubber pool for my daughter and our neighbor's kids to use as the basis for a makeshift private summer camp. And I've seen similar inflatable blue bubbles all over town. I too have seen the same bubbles. Don't tell anyone, one of my neighbors told me when he came over to borrow some chlorine tablets but we're thinking to ride this whole thing out in Zurich, where the numbers are much better. His wife still has her European passport, and they both have jobs that can be done entirely remotely. They'd be joining scores of people I know, not millionaires, but writers and marketers and consultants and web developers who are resettling in Canada or Europe on the logic that their kids shouldn't be sacrificed to their progressive parents' sense of shame about escaping. When I challenge him on the ethics of bailing, he snaps back, at least the ele ele elementary school will have two less bodies to space at six-foot intervals. I'm doing you a favor. <coughs> mm. He can't resist showing me a the photo on his phone from the rental site. It was a gorgeous solar-powered cabin on a remote hillside with the headline, Luxury Eco Lodge. <laughs> he smiled. I always wanted the kids to get a Waldorf education, and now they even have an online option. It sounds idyllic, so much so that I can't help but wonder if the threat of infection is less the reason for his newfound embrace of virtual insulation that is at the end. It's certainly the message I got a couple years ago when a few tech billionaires asked me to water test their doomsday bunker strategies. Ostensibly, they were worried about, quote unquote, the event, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the war, climate catastrophe, or yes, global pandemic that ends life as we know it and forces them to retreat to their high-tech fortresses, fortresses in Alaska or New Zealand. We spent most of the session discuss, discussing potential flaws in their scenario planning, such as whether the human security forces they were intending to hire could be adequately controlled once cash no longer had value. If only they could work out those last few kinks, they could safely escape from the rest of us. At the time, I saw all of this as paranoid prepping <clears throat> All this paranoid prepping is misplaced guilt over what these fellow fellows knew they were doing to the world. It seemed to me that they were in a trap, building heinously ex extractive companies in order to earn enough money to insulate themselves from the reality they were creating by earning money in that way. Instead of figuring out, figuring out how to get away from the rest of us, I told them they might want to focus on making the world a place from which they wouldn't have to retreat. What a concept, huh? But I'm just an author and a media theorist, after all, not a scholar of catas a catastrophe logistics. 
I like to think I've had some success identifying signals from the future. But looking back on the whole episode, I find it hard to believe this group of successful technology investors and entrepreneurs were really paying me for legitimate survival strategies so much as to serve as a kind of dungeon master for their fantasy role, role-playing sessions. <clears throat> I want to pause here and say, this is why people not only distrust, but don't have any respect for the elite or people who are scholarly or people who are experts or people who are specialists, right? <clears throat> people who supposedly know what's going on. <clears throat> people who are, you know, authorities on what is happening. It's because a lot of these people are, are um, low-key psychopathic. <laughs> a lot of these people are low-key, not very smart people or very, very selfish people or very insulated people or very privileged people. Or very entitled, entitled people, right? Low key, that's how these people operate. These experts and these, you know, I know, I know because I have all the money and I have the, you know, I have the the badge of officialdom, right? Anyways, <clears throat> that's all. I'm gonna keep going. Um. Uh, <clears throat> The conversation was almost a form of theater dedicated to developing their collective mutually and reinforcing fantasy. These solar-powered hilltop resorts, chains of defensible floating islands, and robotically till tilled eco-farms were their last were less last resorts than escape fantasies for billionaires who aren't quite rich enough to build space programs like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. No, they weren't scared for the event. On some level, they were hoping for it. I don't think these prepper billionaires are aspiring to live in the world depicted in The Walking Dead because they're horrible people, or at least not just because they're horrible people. They're simply succumbing to one of the dominant ethos of the digital age, which is to, to, to design one's personal reality so meticulously that existential threats are simply removed from, from the equation. The leap from a Fitbit, Fitbit tracking your heart, break, heart rate, excuse me, <clears throat> to annual full bodies cancer scan or from a doorbell surveillance camera to a network of autonomous robot sentries is really just a matter of money. No matter the level of existential security, the Netflix shows we stream are the same. Now, pandemics don't necessarily bring out the be our best instincts either. No matter how many mutual aid networks, school committees, food pantries, race protests, or fundraising efforts in which we participate, I feel as if many of those privileged enough to do so are still making a less public internal calculation. How much are we allowed to use our wealth or, or our technologies to insulate ourselves and our families from the rest of the world? And like a devil on our shoulder, our technology is telling us to go, go it alone. After all, it's an iPad, not an us pad. <clears throat> Ooh, <clears throat> there's a lot. There's a lot of levels to that sentence. A lot of levels to that sentence. Uh, the more advanced the tech, the more cocooned ins insularity it affords. I finally caved and got the Oculus. One of my best friends messaged me on the Signal the other night, or on Signal the other night. Considering how little is available to do out in the real world, this is going to be a game changer. Indeed, his hermetically sealed COVID-19 inspired techno paradise was now complete. Between virtual reality, Amazon, Fresh Direct, and Netflix, and a sustainable income doing crypto trading, he was going to ride out the pandemic in style. Yet, while VRporn.com is certainly a safer sexual strategy in the age of COVID-19 than meeting up with partners through Tinder, every choice to isolate and insulate has its correspondingly negative impact on others. <clears throat> the pool for my daughter wouldn't have gotten here were it not for legions of Amazon workers behind the scenes getting infected in warehouses or risking their health driving delivery trucks all summer. As with Fresh Direct or Instacart, the externalized harm to people and places is kept out of sight. These apps are designed to be addictively fast and self-contained, push-button access to stuff that can be left at the front door without any human contact. The delivery people don't even ring the, d the bell. A photo of the package on the stoop automatically, automatically arrives in the in inbox. Like with Thomas Jefferson's ingenious dumbwaiter, there are no signs of the human labor that brought, brought it. Many of us, of us once 
swore off Amazon after learning of the way it evades taxes, engages in anti-competitive practices, or abuses labor. But here we are, reluctantly, reluctantly re-upping our prime delivery memberships to get the cables, webcams, and Bluetooth headsets we need to attend Zoom meetings that now constitu constitute our own work. <clears throat> Others are reactivating their long-forgotten Facebook accounts to connect with friends, all sharing highly curated depictions of their newfound appreciation for nature, sunsets, and family. And as we do, many of us are lulled further into digital isolation, being rewarded the more we accept the logic of the fully wired home cut off from the rest of the world. And so, the New York Times is busy running photo spreads of wealthy families retreating to their summer homes, second residences worth well more than most of our primary ones, and stories about their successes working remotely from the beach or retrofitting extra bed bedrooms as offices. It's been great here, one venture fund founder explained. If I didn't know there was absolute chaos in the world, I could do this forever. But what if we don't have to know about the chaos in the world? That's the real prom promise of digital technology. We can choose which cable news, Twitter feeds, and YouTube channels to stream. The ones that acknowledge the virus and its impacts are the ones that don't. We can choose to continue wrestling with the civic challenges of the moment, such as whether to send kids back to school full-time, hybrid, or remotely. Or, like some of the wealthiest people in my own town, we can form private pods, hire tutors, and offer our kids the kind of customized elite education we could never justify otherwise. Yes, we are in a pandemic, one pod education provider explained to the Times, but when it comes to education, we also feel some good may even come out of this. I get it. And if I had younger children and, and could afford these things, I might even be tempted to avail myself of them. But all of, these all of these solutions favor those who have already accepted the promise of digital technology to provide what the real world has failed to do. Day traders, for instance, had already discovered the power of the Internet to let them earn income safely from home using nothing but a laptop and some capital. Under the pandemic, more people are opening up online trading accounts than ever, hoping to participate in the video game version of the marketplace. Meanwhile, some of the world's most successful social media posses are moving into luxurious hype houses in Los Angeles and Hawaii where they can live stream their lifestyles, exercise routines, and sex advice as well their product, products of their sponsors to the millions of followers. And maybe it's these young social media enthusiasts thriving more than ever under pandemic conditions who most explicitly embody the original promise of digital technology to provide for our every need. Hold on one second, guys. How y'all doing? 134 watching, 59 likes. Please like up the video. <clears throat> and if you're new, please subscribe. I'm going to go back to this article and try to finish it with the time that I have left. We're, we're getting close. I remember back around 1990 when, when psychedelics philosopher Timothy Leary first read Stuart Brand's book, The Media Lab about the new digital technology center MIT had created in its architecture department. Leary devoured the book cover to cover over the course of one long day. Around sunset, just as he was finishing, he threw it across the living room in disgust. Look at the index, he said. All of the names, less than 3% are women. That tells you something. He went on to explain his core problem with the media lab in the digital universe these technology pioneers were envisioning. They want to recreate the womb. As Leary, the psychologist, saw it, the boys building our digital future were developing technology to simulate the ideal woman, the one their mothers could never be. Unlike their human mothers, a predictive algorithm could anticipate their every need in advance and deliver it directly, removing every trace of friction and longing. These guys would be able to float in their virtual bubbles, what the media lab called artificial ecology, and never have to face the messy, harsh reality demanded of people living in the real world with women and people of color and even those with differing views. For there's the real rub with digital isolation, the problem those billionaires identified when we were gaming out their bunker strategies. The people and things we'd leave behind are still out there. And the more we ask them to service our bubbles, the more oppressed and angry they're going to get. No, no matter how far Ray Kurzweil gets with his artificial intelligence project at Google, we cannot simply rise from the chrysalis of matter as pure consciousness. There's no Dropbox plan that will let us upload body and soul to the cloud. We are still here on the ground with the same people and on the same planet. We are being encouraged to leave behind. There's no escape from the others. 
Not that people aren't trying. The ultimate digital escape fantasy would require some previously perverse enforcement of privilege. Anything to prevent the unwashed masses, the folks working in the meat processing plants, Amazon warehouses, UPS trucks, or not at all, from violating the sacred bounds of our virtual amniotic, amnionic sacs. Sh sure, we can replace the factory workers with robots and the delivery people with drones, but then they'll even have less at stake in maintaining our digital retreats. I can't help but seeing the dismantling of the post office as a last-ditch attempt to keep the majority from piercing the bubbles of digital privilege through something as simple as voting. Climb to safety and then pull the ladder up after ourselves. No more voting, no more subsidized delivery <clears throat> of alternative journalism. That was the original constitutional purpose for, for a fully funded post office. <clears throat> Excuse me. So much the better for the algorithms. String, streaming us the picture of the world we want to see, uncorrupted by imagery of what's really happening out there. And if it does come through, just swipe left, and the algorithms will never will know never to interrupt your dream state with such real news again. No, of course, we'll never get there. Climate, poverty, disease, and famine don't respect the guardian boundary play, play space divine, defined by the Oculus VR's user preferences. Just as the billionaires can never, ever truly leave humanity behind, none of us can climb back into the womb. When times are hard, sure, take what peace and comfort you can afford. Use whatever tech you can get your hands on to make your kids' online education work a bit better. Enjoy the glut of streaming media left over from the heyday of the Netflix, Amazon, HBO wars. But don't let this passing, yes, passing, crisis, fool you into buying technology's false promise of escaping from humanity to play video games alone in perpetuity. Our COVID-19 isolation is giving us a rare opportunity to see where this road takes us and to choose to use our technologies to take a very different one. Good stuff. Hey guys, remember to like, share, and subscribe, and you can support the channel. Hit the links below, uh, PayPal, Patreon, Square. Uh, also, if you'd like to watch the live streams, you can watch the live streams on my Patreon channel, you can subscribe for as little as a dollar. Um, so hopefully I will see you over there and thanks so much.